So we now have the definition of the characteristic polynomial, and we understand that the roots of that polynomial are exactly the eigenvalues of our matrix. I'd like to turn now to uh, study some other properties of the characteristic polynomial. So let's start by making an observation. If the eigenvalues are the roots of the characteristic polynomial, then the fundamental theorem of algebra says that the characteristic polynomial factors as the product of a bunch of terms, where each term is of the form t minus an eigenvalue raised to some power. And um, the fa so this is a general fact of the fundamental uh, theorem of algebra. And because the eigenvalues are the roots of the characteristic polynomial, we know we can factor our characteristic polynomial in this way. So um, the, uh, the powers that appear in this factorization um, have names. So the algebraic multiplicity of an eigenvalue is defined in notation as am sub a of the eigenvalue equals the power of the term t minus that eigenvalue in the factorization of the characteristic polynomial. So the algebraic multiplicity is a concept that contrasts with the geometric multiplicity of an eigenvalue. Remember the geometric multiplicity is the dimension of the eigenspace and the algebraic multiplicity now is the power that the term t minus the eigenvalue appears to in the factorization of the characteristic polynomial of the matrix. So um, the first thing we know about the algebraic multiplicities is that they must always sum to the size of the matrix. And this is appealing to the general fact of poly polynomials, which says that when we factor a polynomial, the sum of all of the powers is equal to the degree of the polynomial. So if we sum all of the algebraic multiplicities of the eigenvalues, we always get the number n. Okay, so let's look at an example. So here we have a three by three matrix and I managed to factor the characteristic polynomial as t plus seven quantity squared multiplied by t minus two. What sorts of information do we have given the setup? Well, um, one thing we can do is we can organize all of the so-called eigendata into a table. So um, we know what the eigenvalues are of this matrix because the um, characteristic polynomial is factored. We know that um, the eigenvalues here have to be negative seven because negative seven is our first root of the characteristic polynomial here. And uh, two, because two is the second um, uh, root of our characteristic polynomial. We can also record the algebraic multiplicities of these uh, eigenvalues because we have a complete factorization of the characteristic polynomial. The first eigenvalue is lambda equals negative seven and t plus seven occurs twice as a factor in the characteristic polynomial. So the algebraic multiplicity is two. On the other hand, for lambda equals one, the, um, the, the factor, t, or, sorry, for lambda equals two, the factor t minus two appears only once in the factorization. So the algebraic multiplicity of lambda equals two as an eigenvalue here is equal to one. We can also calculate the geometric multiplicities in this example, but it's important to note here that we'd have to do a little bit of work. What we would need to do is we would need to look at our difference matrix, A minus lambda times the identity, and look at the dimension of the null space of that matrix, which is the nullity of that matrix. This is how geometric multiplicity is defined. And even though we could calculate those numbers ourselves, it's important to note that we'd have to do a little bit of work to, to accomplish that task. So um, we'd have to work to find the geometric multiplicities here um, whereas we didn't have to do any work to find the algebraic multiplicities because they were essentially given to us in this example. Um, let's look at another example. So here we're defining a matrix J and I've inserted some vertical and horizontal lines in this matrix just to make um, the parts of this matrix more readable. The uh, lines in this matrix aren't contributing anything uh, uh, substantive to the matrix at all. 
So the idea is that we're looking at a diagonal matrix where um, the numbers on the diagonal are not negative 9, negative 9, 11, 11, and 17. So this is a 5 by 5 matrix. And almost all of the other entries are, are equal to 0, except this one in the 1, 2 position and this one in the 3, 4 position. So this isn't quite a diagonal matrix, but it's almost a diagonal matrix. It is, however, an upper triangular matrix. Now, one thing we know about upper triangular matrices is that their diagonals or the, their eigenvalues live on the diagonal. And in fact, if we were to calculate the characteristic polynomial here, we would end up with an immediate factorization because we could just multiply each of the diagonal entries in the determinant of t times the identity minus j here. What we end up with is the factorization t plus 9 squared multiplied by t minus 11 squared multiplied by t minus 17. Let's think about the table of eigenvalues for this example. So we can immediately see if by either looking at the matrix itself or by looking at the roots of its characteristic polynomial that the eigenvalues are the diagonal entries, negative 9, 11, and 17. Um, what are the algebraic multiplicities? Well, because we have a factorization of the characteristic polynomial, we can simply read off the algebraic multiplicities. The algebraic multiplicity of negative 9 is uh, equal to 2 here. The algebraic multiplicity of 11 is also equal to 2. And the algebraic multiplicity of 17 is equal to 1. Now, how would we go about figuring out the geometric multiplicities in this example? Well, um, we would figure out the geometric multiplicities by taking our matrix, subtracting off the eigenvalue that we're studying from the diagonal, and then looking at the nullity of the resulting matrix. Well, um, what would happen here if we subtracted negative 9 from every diagonal entry in this matrix? Normally, we would end up with a difference matrix that we would have to do some analysis on, but because this matrix is upper triangular, it's actually pretty simple to figure out the rank. If we subtracted negative 9 from each of the diagonal entries here, we would zero out the first two diagonal entries, but the rest of the diagonal entries would remain non-zero. These 11s would, uh, what, if we subtract negative 9, would become 20s, and uh, this 17, if we uh, subtracted a negative 9, would be the same as 17 plus 9, uh, which is what, 26. So we would have two zeros and then a bunch of uh, non-zero numbers on the diagonal. And um, keep in mind, if, when we uh, subtract off these two negative nines, when we convert these negative nines to zeros, we still have this one up here. So what we end up with is a column of zeros and then four pivot columns. So the resulting difference matrix would have nullity one. So the geometric multiplicity is one. The same would happen if we subtracted 11 off from the diagonal of every term here. If we subtract off 11 from every diagonal term, we would end up with a diagonal of negative 20, negative 20, 0, 0, uh, what, um, 8, or no, um, 6. So the first two and the last diagonal entries would be non-zero. The um, third and fourth diagonal entries would be zero. But the fourth diagonal entry has a one above it, so this column remains a pivot, pivot column. So we would end up with one column of zeros and then four pivot columns, which means the difference matrix has nullity one, which means the geometric multiplicity of 11 as an eigenvalue is also equal to one. What would happen if we subtracted off 17 from the diagonal? Well, the only entry that zeroes out would be in the bottom right-hand corner here, which would produce a column of zeros, every other column would end up being a pivot column. So again, we would end up with a matrix with nullity 1, which means the geometric multiplicity of 17 as an eigenvalue is equal to 1. So here what we have is a, a scenario where, because the matrix is nice enough, we can calculate the geometric multiplicities in our head without having to do lots of complicated row reductions. This doesn't work for matrices in general. For general matrices, we have to do some work to calculate the geometric multiplicities. Uh, the last thing I want to point out here is we have now what I like to call a complete table of eigenvalues. We have a list of all of the eigenvalues along with all of their geometric multiplicities, 
and all of their algebraic multiplicities. Uh, one thing to point out here is that each of the geometric multiplicities does not exceed the algebraic multiplicity. Um, for 17, the geometric multiplicity happens to equal the algebraic multiplicity, but for negative 9 and 11, the geometric multiplicities are less than the algebraic multiplicities. So um, it turns out that that's no accident. This always happens. So our first uh, property of uh, geometric and algebraic multiplicities states that um, we already know that the geometric multiplicity has minimum value equal to 1, but it turns out that the geometric multiplicity can never exceed the algebraic multiplicity. This turns out to be a, a non-trivial theorem in linear algebra, but it is true. So um, we can sometimes use this to our advantage. So here we have a very complicated matrix. Uh, it looks like this matrix is what? Three, four, five, six, seven, an eight by eight matrix. So here we have the data of an eight by eight matrix. And someone has gone to the trouble of factoring the characteristic polynomial in this example. Let's look and see what we can do with this data. Well, um, we can immediately figure out the uh, eigenvalues in this scenario by looking up the roots of the characteristic polynomial. Here, the roots are negative 1, which is uh, one of the roots. Another root is 0. Another root is 2. And then another root is equal to 3. So this 8 by 8 matrix has four eigenvalues, and they are negative 1, 0, 2, and 3. We can determine each of the algebraic multiplicities in this scenario by simply looking up the powers of the appropriate terms in the characteristic polynomial. For lambda equals negative 1, we're looking at the factor t plus 1, which occurs twice in the factorization, so the algebraic multiplicity is equal to 2. For lambda equals 0, we're looking at the term just equal to t in the characteristic polynomial, and this, a term, this term occurs three times in the characteristic polynomial, so the algebraic multiplicity is equal to 3. For lambda equals 2, we're looking at the term t minus 2, which occurs twice, which means the algebraic multiplicity is equal to 2. And for lambda equals 3, we're looking at the term t minus 3, which occurs once, which means that the eigenvalue has algebraic multiplicity 1. Now that we've determined all of the algebraic multiplicities, we can use our previous theorem to get a list of possibilities for the geometric multiplicities. Because the algebraic multiplicity for lambda equals negative 1 is 2, we know that the geometric multiplicity for lambda equals negative 1 is either 1 or 2, because we know the geometric multiplicity cannot exceed the algebraic multiplicity. We can figure which of these numbers is correct, by subtracting off negative 1 times the identity from this matrix and calculating the nullity. But the issue here is because this matrix is so large, that would take a lot of effort. Um, whereas we do get an idea for what we will get in that process. We're either going to get nullity 1 or nullity 2. For lambda equals 0, we have algebraic multiplicity 3, which means that the geometric multiplicity can be any of 1, 2, or 3. Again, the minimum value for the geometric multiplicity is 1, and what our previous uh, example says, or previous theorem says, is that the geometric multiplicity cannot exceed the algebraic multiplicity. So the list of possible geometric multiplicities here are 1, 2, or 3. Again, here we can figure out which one of these is correct ourselves by subtracting off 0 times the identity, which is to say we don't change A at all, and then figure out the nullity of A. Whichever uh, uh, Whatever the nullity is, that's the correct geometric multiplicity. But again, we'd have to do work to, to figure that out, whereas here we can list off the possibilities. Um, for lambda equals 2, the algebraic multiplicity is 2, which means the geometric multiplicity is either 1 or 2. And for lambda equals 3, the algebraic multiplicity is 1, which actually forces the geometric multiplicity to equal 1. So uh, again, the since the geometric multiplicity cannot exceed the algebraic multiplicity, an algebraic multiplicity of 1 means that the geometric multiplicity is forced to equal 1. So we happen to know that um, a minus 3 times the identity is a matrix with nullity 1 in this case. So here we have an example where even if we have a terrible matrix, 
if somebody manages to factor the characteristic polynomial, we can read off all of the eigenvalues, we know exactly what their algebraic multiplicities are, and we can list off some possible geometric multiplicities. Um, let's see another example where we don't even have the matrix, but we do have a factorization of the characteristic polynomial. So here we have, we're apparently studying some matrix where the characteristic polynomial factors as t plus 4 to the 6th multiplied by t minus 2 to the 7th multiplied by t minus 3 squared multiplied by t. Well, um, we can use this factorization to write down the entire table of eigenvalues. The roots of the characteristic polynomial are lambda equals negative 4, lambda equals 2, lambda equals 3, and lambda equals 0. So those are the roots of the characteristic polynomial, which means those are the eigenvalues of whatever matrix we're studying here. We can calculate the algebraic multiplicities of these eigenvalues by looking and seeing how many times the factor t minus the eigenvalue occurs in our factorization of the characteristic polynomial. For lambda equals negative 4, we're looking at the term t plus 4, which occurs 6 times, so the algebraic multiplicity is 6. For lambda equals 2, the factor t minus 2 occurs 7 times, so the algebraic multiplicity is 7. For lambda equals 3, the factor t minus 3 occurs twice, so the algebraic multiplicity is 2. And for lambda equals 0, we're um, looking at the factor t, which occurs only once, which is algebraic multiplicity 1. Now, given this table, we can list off possible geometric multiplicities for the eigenvalues in this case. The algebraic multiplicity of lambda equals negative 4 is 6. So the geometric multiplicity for lambda equals negative 4 can be any number between 1 and 6. Since we don't have the matrix written down for us, we're actually not sure which of these numbers is correct. We would need access to the actual matrix to, uh, and do further calculations to figure out the right choice here. For lambda equals 2, the algebraic multiplicity is 7, which means the geometric multiplicity can be any number between 1 and 7. Again, we can't say anything further here without knowing what the actual matrix is and calculating the geometric multiplicity with that matrix. So the best we can say here is that the geometric multiplicity is any number between 1 and 7. For lambda equals 3, the algebraic multiplicity is 2, which means that the geometric multiplicity is either 1 or 2. And for lambda equals 0, the algebraic multiplicity is 1, which again forces the geometric multiplicity to be one. So even though we don't know the matrix in this example, because someone told us the factorization of its characteristic polynomial, we can say lots of intelligent things about the matrix. Um, one thing to note here is that apparently whatever matrix we're studying is zero, or, or sorry, is singular, because lambda equals zero is one of the eigenvalues. Additionally, we can figure out the size of this matrix by summing up all of the algebraic multiplicities of the eigenvalues. Remember that the sum of all of the algebraic multiplicities always equals the size of the matrix. And here, the algebraic multiplicities are 6, 7, 2, and 1. And uh, 6 plus 7 is uh, what? Uh, 13 plus 2 is 15, plus 1 is 16. So this was a 16 by 16 singular matrix in this example. The eigenvalues were negative 4, 2, 3, and 0. The algebraic multiplicities were 6, 7, 2, and 1. And we here what we have is a list of possible geometric multiplicities for each of the eigenvalues. So even if we don't know the matrix, if someone factors the characteristic polynomial, and uh, doesn't tell us the matrix, we can still say lots of uh, smart things about the matrix. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to see how the characteristic polynomial interacts with some of the other concepts we've developed about matrices. Remember the notion of the trace of a matrix. The trace of a matrix is the sum of the diagonal entries. This is a concept we introduced last time when we discussed complex numbers. So for instance, here we have a perfectly good 4 by 4 matrix. 
To calculate the trace, we take each of the diagonal entries and add them together. So the trace here is negative 6 plus negative 16 plus 1 plus 2. And when we sum these numbers together, we get the number negative 19. So the trace is a very simple number we can calculate for every matrix because the only thing we have to do is sum up the diagonal entries. Um, what I want to do now is I want to look at the general formula for a 2 by 2 characteristic polynomial. So let's say that our general 2 by 2 matrix A has rows A, B, C, and D. Well, to calculate the characteristic polynomial of this matrix, we take T times the identity and subtract A, and then take a determinant. So now we're taking the determinant of the matrix whose rows are T minus A, 0 minus B, which is negative B, 0 minus C, which is negative C, and T minus D. Well, to find this determinant, we can apply the, the formula. We multiply the diagonal entries and subtract the product of the other two entries. When we do that product and we expand the entire uh, uh, characteristic polynomial out, we end up with a quadratic polynomial whose terms are t squared minus the quantity a plus d times t plus the quantity ad minus bc. There's something interesting to note about what happens here. For one, um, this uh, coefficient of t is negative a plus d, and a plus d is the trace of the original 2 by 2 matrix. Another thing to notice is that the constant coefficient of this polynomial is the quantity ad minus bc, which is the determinant of our original matrix. So the trace and the determinant appear as coefficients inside of the characteristic polynomial. So this gives us a general formula for the characteristic polynomial of any 2x2 two two matrix. The characteristic polynomial of any 2x2 two two matrix is t squared minus the trace of the matrix multiplied by t plus the determinant of the matrix. So when I'm doing 2x2 two two, uh, 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 characteristic polynomials, this is the formula that I, I, I commit to memory. Um, and it turns out that this uh, one example generalizes, and this is really a, a uh, consequence of the VTA formulas that we stated last time. So our next theorem says that the characteristic polynomial of every n by n matrix looks like this. We already know that the characteristic polynomial of an n by n matrix has degree n, so the largest power of t is n. We know that it's monic, so the coefficient of t to the n is always 1. And it turns out that the coefficient of the next uh, of the term uh, that has the next highest power, t to the n minus 1, is always the negative of the trace of our matrix. It also turns out that the constant coefficient of the characteristic polynomial is always negative 1 to the size of the matrix multiplied by the determinant of the matrix. So the coefficient of t to the n minus 1 is always negative the trace, and the constant coefficient is always negative 1 to the n multiplied by the determinant. Um, if we follow how the VTA formulas track with our trace determinant formula here, what we end up with are formulas for the trace and the determinant in terms of the eigenvalues and their algebraic multiplicities. So the trace of a matrix turns out to be the sum of all of the eigenvalues where each eigenvalue is scaled by its algebraic multiplicity. This is exactly how the Vita formula worked for the t to the n minus 1 term in a uh, general polynomial where the roots were lambda 1, lambda 2, up to lambda k here. So the punchline is the trace is always the sum of the eigenvalues, where each eigenvalue is multiplied by its algebraic multiplicity. We also get a determinant formula, which says that the determinant of a matrix is, which is evidently negative one to the n 
times the constant coefficient? Well, the, the VTAU formula tells us that the determinant of any matrix is therefore the product of all of the eigenvalues, where each eigenvalue is raised to its algebraic multiplicity. So to calculate trace, assuming that we know the eigenvalues and their algebraic multiplicities, we sum all the eigenvalues multiplied their by their algebraic multiplicities. And to find the determinant, we multiply all of the eigenvalues together and then raise each one to its algebraic multiplicity. So um, let's see this in an example. So let's say that we're studying a matrix and its characteristic polynomial is this complicated seventh degree polynomial. The question is, what sorts of things can we say about the matrix? Well, um, for one thing, the degree here is seven, which means that our matrix is a seven by seven matrix. Also, if we look at the next uh, highest power, t to the seven minus one, which is six, we see that the coefficient is negative two. So this is telling us that the trace of our matrix is negative negative two, which is two. So whatever the matrix is, it has to be seven by seven with trace two. And if we look at the constant coefficient here, we find that the constant coefficient is six, which means that the determinant of our matrix should be negative one to the size of the matrix, which is seven, multiplied by six, which turns out to be negative six. So even though we don't know what our matrix is necessarily, since we know what the characteristic polynomial is and we don't even have it factored, we still know that this is a seven by seven matrix because the degree is seven. We know the trace is the negation of the t to the uh, six term, which is equal to two. And we know the determinant is negative one to the seventh, which is negative one, multiplied by the constant term, which is six. So the determinant is equal to negative six. So this again illustrates that if we just have the characteristic polynomial, we still have some important information about the matrix. Uh, here's another example where we have a terrible big matrix and we've managed to factor the characteristic polynomial. Well, what sorts of things can we say here? Well, for one, we can use this characteristic polynomial to read off all of the eigenvalues. Here, the eigenvalues are evidently seven, three, negative one, and zero. And the algebraic multiplicities are one, two, two, and three. So to find the trace here, we can take lambda equals seven and multiply that by the algebraic multiplicity. Then we can take lambda equals three and multiply by the algebraic multiplicity two. Then we can take lambda equals negative one, multiply by the algebraic multiplicity two, and then take lambda equals zero and multiply by the algebraic multiplicity three. When we add all of these terms up, we end up with 11 here. So the trace is forced to equal 11 for this matrix. So again, where did these numbers come from? We're identifying all of the eigenvalues. Then we're multiplying each of the eigenvalues by their algebraic multiplicities. And when we sum all of those numbers up, we end up with 11 here. Let's look at a, 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 a different example. So here we have a different example where the characteristic polynomial is again factored for us. Let's say we wanted to calculate the determinant. Well, what we're supposed to do here is multiply each of the eigenvalues together, but we raise each one to its algebraic multiplicity. So here, the determinant of our matrix should be the first eigenvalue, which is seven, multiplied by the second eigenvalue, which is three, multiplied by the third eigenvalue, which is negative one, multiplied by the fourth eigenvalue, which is one. But we need to take care and, and raise each of these or exponentiate each of these eigenvalues to their algebraic multiplicities. The algebraic multiplicity of seven is one. The algebraic multiplicity of three is two. The algebraic multiplicity of negative one is two, and the algebraic multiplicity of one is three. Well, when we multiply seven to the one by three squared, by negative one squared, by one cubed, we end up with 63. So this is a, an example of a matrix that has determinant 63. And since this was such a large matrix, 
this is actually a useful calculation because it means that we don't have to do lots of complicated row reductions uh, to calculate this determinant. So here's an example where we're using our knowledge of eigenvalues to find the determinant of this matrix. Um, here uh, we have a, a, another example where our matrix is four by four and someone has uh, bothered to find the eigenvalues for us. Here the eigenvalues are lambda one equals negative nine, lambda two equals three, and lambda three equals 10. Um, one question we might ask is whether or not this matrix has other eigenvalues. So what we have here is a four by four and we've only listed three eigenvalues. It's certainly possible that this four by four only has three eigenvalues, but it might have four eigenvalues. How could we attack a problem like this? Well, one thing to remember is that if we had a fourth eigenvalue, it would, be, it would need to be accounted for in the trace formula. So we would have to, uh, the trace of this matrix would have to be the first eigenvalue plus the second plus the third plus the fourth. And if we sum all, if we put all those numbers together, what we find is lambda one is negative nine, lambda two equals three, lambda three equals 10. And if we look at the matrix itself, we know what the trace is. The trace is negative 30 plus 30, which is zero, plus 12 plus four, which is 16. So what we have now is an equation that says 16 is negative nine plus three plus 10. Well, negative nine uh, plus three plus 10 is equal to four, which says 16 is the same as four plus lambda four, which says lambda four should be equal to 12 here. So in fact, this four by four matrix does have a fourth eigenvalue and the trace formula says that fourth eigenvalue has to equal 12.